Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. Before we dive into today's episode, which is an excellent conversation with Dr. Eckler on allergy and anaphylaxis, I want to bring your attention to Clinical Pathways. That's right. If you didn't hear the announcement earlier this month or see it at ebmedicine.net, we have a new product. It's in beta, which means if you go take a look at it and like it, you can register for 50% off your first year by clicking the link that's there on the website. You can find it at clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net, and it is an interactive version of all of those pathways that we already publish every month in emergency medicine practice, pediatric emergency medicine practice, and evidence-based urgent care. And while you're there, why not leave us a little feedback? Tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't like. So many more pathways are coming down the pipeline. It is going to be an incredible resource, and I can't wait for you to see it. And now, let's jump into our conversation with Dr. Eckler. Okay, so today we're talking about management of allergic reactions and anaphylaxis in the emergency department. It is the July 2022 article in Emergency Medicine Practice, written by Dr. Zeke and Dr. Sudir, and it's an excellent article discussing the emergency department treatment for allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, Dr. Eckler and I today are discussing it because I really was interested in the article and Dr. Eckler has a special interest in allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. So here we are again. Welcome back to the podcast, TR. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. I, I find that this has totally defined my career and I have so many anaphylaxis stories that even go back to before I was a doctor that I just, I really feel really passionate about this issue. Have you actually ever had anaphylaxis? I have not actually, which I I count myself very lucky because looking at at this paper, like the lifetime incidence between like seven and 22% really gave me some pause as to whether or not I I need to be more cautious about this for myself or just for my kids. Because now that I have kids, I, I worry about these kind of things. But I remember when I was in college, one of the the guys in my dorm had a bad allergy and he kind of, he told me about it once and I said, boy, do you have an EpiPen? And he said, oh, come on, I'm, I'm fine. I know what not to eat. And I remember he went to the dining hall and they had the fried cod and fried shrimp. And he was like kind of being cheeky and he reached in in front of the lunch lady and grabbed one of the fried cod pieces and threw it in his mouth. And he was like, ha ha, you know? And she looked at him and goes, oops. And she switched the signs for cod oh, and my shrimp. Gosh. So he walks, he, he doesn't want to look, he doesn't want to look not cool. So he sits there for like 10 minutes with his mouth and his throat, just like gradually his tongue, just swelling up. And he walked over to the dorm and he found me and he goes, oh, help. Oh, shrimp. And I, I looked at him like, what? And it took me maybe five seconds. I was like, oh God, you ate some shrimp and you're having a reaction. So I just had him sit down and I was like out back, like grilling some stuff for a dinner we were having. And I just had him sit down and I called an ambulance. And then he and I just sat there for the longest two minutes while the ambulance drove across campus. Staring at each other. And gave me pen. And I remembered the sheer terror that I had that I was like, I can do nothing. I, there's nothing to do. There is no EpiPen in the dorm. This is where we're at. Oh my gosh, that is terrible. That so, is terrible. So now being an emergency doctor, that feeling like I feel so much better when I'm in the ER and I have EpiPens. But I, I remember in residency, I felt like every time we'd see anaphylaxis and it would be like, some good symptoms and then a, and then, you know, something that looked systemic like cardiovascular and Robin or respiratory. And I felt like my attendings were always like, oh, let's give them the steroids. Let's give them the Benadryl. We'll see if they can get through it. And I'd always be like, why can't we give the epi? Like there's the only contraindication is what? Like STEMI, like acute ST elevation, like death, you know, like I think. Is the only contra- well, yeah. And death. If they're dead already, it's probably not going to help. Otherwise you should give it. <laughs> but, but so like, I, and this, I think this is, maybe my favorite case. I think, I think that your, your duty as a, as a physician is if you see challenging cases that you should present them as, as publicly as you can to make sure that other people learn from the things that you've been through and not always to say mistakes. Cause I, I really felt like we did the best we could in this case, but I had a, a gentleman come in in residency where I was working in New York city and he came in and he spoke Cantonese, but he didn't want a translator. He wanted his daughter to translate for him. He was maybe like 65 years old had a history of throat cancer that was in remission, had like a bunch of scarring to his neck, but like that was well controlled, had notes from EMT that said everything was not progressing. And he had a chronic perforated otitis media for which he took one daily dose of Cipro, like every day. 
and his ear just kind of looked like it. There was a hole and it was necrotic, but it looked not red and not angry. It just looked like there was that his eardrum was just kind of gradually rotting. So he came in with a cough and congestion and just feeling like junk, like maybe something viral, maybe something else, but he was a little short of breath. So we checked all his labs and did everything else. And I think he hadn't taken a Cipro that day. So we gave him a dose of Cipro and we called ENT and ENT said, and we're like, Hey, you know, like he's kind of short of breath. Do you think there's something going on? Like, is, is his throat kind of getting tight? And they said, Hey, we know this guy. We'll come down and scope him and just make sure. I said, really? Like, that's the most helpful thing ENT had ever said. So we check all his labs, chest x-ray, ENT comes, looks at him. Everybody says, oh, he looks great. And my attending and I go back over to assess him, discharge him, and he just looks horrible. He's just, he's breathing hard. His lungs had been clear, and now he sounds wet. And just his heart rate has gone up, and he's like in the 130s, 120s, 130s. And he, and he's just, and he just looks like he's got this rash that's starting to brew. And his daughter says, what happened? Like this all started after you gave him that medicine. And we were like, the Cipro? Look, I, how, like he's on that every day. Like we don't think it's another formulation. And I remember turning to my attending and saying, look, I, I don't know what happened, but I don't think like everything else looks good. I think he's having an allergic reaction. I think this is anaphylaxis. I just want to give him some epi and just see what happens. And we kind of went back and forth. And he was like, ah, I think this is just a worsening, you know, upper respiratory tract infection. We'll give him some breathing treatments. We'll kind of, maybe we'll CT his chest and we'll just see if there's not something else. So we, we sign him out because it's the end of our shift. The next ER team evaluates him. All his other stuff is negative. Everybody kind of keeps watching him. He just gradually kind of gets a little bit better, but not all the way better. Still a little hypoxic. Gets admitted. The ICU team sees him. Everybody just kind of watches, watches, watches. They scream him out of the ICU. And this other hospitalist picks him up read through all his records, like down to the last page. And even after the daughter said, no, he doesn't have any allergies. He's not allergic to anything. The last page of his records in our system shows that he was admitted like 10 years ago for an anaphylactic reaction causing cardiac arrest to lidocaine. Hmm. And ENT came by when they scoped him and asked the oh, nurses man. to order some viscous lidocaine so they could scope him. So the nurses put an order in under Dr. Eckler for just a little bit of viscous lidocaine. So it definitely looked like wow. Dr. Eckler ordered some viscous lidocaine and had it put right into that patient with an anaphylactic yeah. allergy causing cardiac arrest to viscous lidocaine. But he didn't arrest. He, he just not he got arrest better. This time. Got, got gradually better. Wow. But what was seen by four teams before this one hospitalist really looked through like pages and pages and got to the final end of his records and was like, oh, he has anaphylaxis to lidocaine. And hey, look, somebody put some lidocaine in here. Wow. Hey, that's incredible and even more incredible that it was on the last page of his records and not listed in his allergy list. Not at all. all things. Into the credit of the EMR, anaphylactic <laughs> reaction causing cardiac arrest, not carried over from Buried. existing medical records. That's so helpful. So helpful. I tell you, in the introduction paragraph of this article, there are some interesting numbers that surprised me. First, 1% of emergency department visits are attributed to allergic reactions, which is actually pretty high, I think. I, I was surprised to see it's that high. The number of hospitalizations and ED visits for allergic reactions is going up, but the fatality rate is still low, less than 1%. That's a good thing. And still, I have heard this numerous times. They quote two articles from 2014 and 2015, both of which were conducted in the ED, that showed that up to 57% of anaphylactic reactions are not recognized. And the first line treatment for anaphylaxis, which is epinephrine, is not given in up to 80% of cases, which just blows my mind. That is a ridiculous number with all the talk about anaphylaxis and allergic reactions that we still have a difficulty in recognizing it. And in providing the first line therapy is just insanity. Some of that, I understand, is because of a lack of consensus about the definition. And the article goes on to talk about how we have a lack of randomized control studies because it's really hard to tell somebody who's having an anaphylactic reaction that you're going to enroll them in the study where you're not going to give them epinephrine. So I can understand that. <laughs> so so uh, you saw that, that Cochrane review that said, that there was no randomized controlled trial showing that epinephrine works. And it reminded me of that paper that was like, 
there's no randomized control trial demonstrating that parachutes work. Exactly. Same, exactly. same feeling. I was like, exactly. yeah, because. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it does. It is a good reminder that the a lack of evidence does not necessarily mean a lack of efficacy in certain mm -hmm. cases. And this is one of them. So epinephrine is really hard to study in a randomized controlled trial, but it still remains the first line therapy for anaphylaxis. Interestingly, in the criteria for anaphylaxis, there's an entire section of the article discussing the initial criteria that were established back in 2006 by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network. And then the subsequent revision that occurred in 2020 by the World Allergy Organization. Uh, wow. The wow, exactly. And in reading through those criteria, I can totally understand why there's a lack of consensus because whoever wrote these criteria needs to come work in the emergency department and work alongside some providers who are trying to make this diagnosis so that they can rewrite the criteria. The bulk of the criteria require two organ systems to be involved. Or if there is hypotension, you only need one organ system involved. And the way that the criteria are listed really is quite confusing. It doesn't really need to be that confusing. The criteria are respiratory compromise or mm -hmm. hypotension. If you have either of those two, you have anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. And then the two organ systems are kind of redundant because it's, it's rash or skin manifestations or, or mucous membrane. That's all considered one organ system plus GI symptoms or respiratory compromise or low blood pressure. But we already talked about respiratory compromise or low blood pressure. I think yep. a much better way to say this is if they have respiratory compromise or low blood pressure, they have anaphylaxis. And if they have rash plus GI symptoms, they have anaphylaxis. And that's really all you need to know. You don't have to sit here and dwell upon all of these multiple variations that are just redundant. Because if they have hypotension, and they are responding to something that they just ingested, there you go. You have anaphylaxis. You don't actually have to have a rash. And if they have respiratory distress and they're responding to something they just ingested or just got stung by a bee, <laughs> then uh, they have anaphylaxis. And this kind of hemming and hawing about criteria seems a little academic and maybe clinically unhelpful, which I think is a point they brought out pretty well in the article. They didn't, they didn't state it probably as strongly as I just did. But that's it's good. So I find I find in teaching residents that the table they laid out on it's table seven. It's on page seven, which is nice. Seven and seven. But I find this is what I like to give residents and like students when I'm teaching them, which is instead of trying to look at those criteria, which I find somewhat challenging, I just like to stop and be like, look, do you think this could be an allergic reaction? If yes, you should be already thinking about epinephrine. So is it an allergic reaction? Do they have a rash? Yes or no. If they don't, 10% of anaphylaxis doesn't have a rash. And I think that that really should give you some pause that not having a rash doesn't mean no epi. If the rash is absent, this can still be anaphylaxis. You can still give the epi. I, I had a case out in the rural places one time that EMS brought a gentleman in that was alter mental status and he had gone out for a walk and they were trying to sell me that he had gotten into some drugs and that's why he was all altered. And he, in, in his case, he didn't initially have a rash and then like clearly was developing a rash in the emergency room and his blood pressure was dropping and he was confused and he was altered and couldn't really give us a story. And I could see everybody heading towards like, oh, this is ingestion. We need Narcan. We need this. And I, I just kept looking at the rash and it was getting more to carry And I said, he needs Epi. Like he, something happened to him that, that this is an anaphylactic reaction. And five minutes later, he sat up and looked great and was talking to us and said, yeah, I get stung by a bee. I was out walking and I got stung by a bee and I hit it the and all of a sudden I smelled again. it. And it, it, it really was, I felt good with that idea being that like, they're not always going to give you rest. They're not always going to be the right picture, but the downside of trying Epi is so minimal. Like, you know, that, that should be your first thought, not just let's see how they do with the steroids and the Benadryl and the antihistamines. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. If we haven't hit that enough, we're going to talk about this a lot more today. Is Every five minutes. Every five minutes. 
if there's one thing you take away from this article, it should be give the epi. So on that note, I found this article really interesting because one, I remember arguing with an attending in residency, whether it should be IM or sub Q. And I had just looked it up and I was like, it's IM. We should give it IM. And he's like, no, it's sub Q. And that it must have just been like, that's where he trained and that's what they did. And so that's what. Well, you know, interestingly, knew. I think it, at one point it was sub Q. Mm -hmm. That was the standard of care. And then a couple of studies were published saying that the IM absorption, especially in the quadriceps, which is where you're supposed to give this in the anterior thigh, is actually better because you get peak serum availability more quickly than mm -hmm. you do in the sub Q administration. And if you are having skin manifestations, you may not be perfusing the skin or you may not get consistent absorption of the epinephrine. And so I am treatment or I am administration is the gold standard, even in the emergency department. I mean, we, I catch our own nurses just, you know, we give it in, in the deltoid, right? It's yes. kinda, you know, I need to give it, I'm going to give it in the delt. And when I say things like we're giving it, I am, I get this look like, but you mean sub Q and I go, no, no, no. I mean, I am, and you better yeah. give it in the thigh. And they go, oh, well, it's not a child. And I say, it's not a child, but we're still giving it in the thigh. That more, is the location. More blood flow to leg than arm. And that's that was my takeaway from this. I Before this article, I was like, I mean, I kind of thought I am any big muscle. They were good, like glute, delt, thigh. I, I thought I was fine. And now, having taken that away, I would be like, it's going to be in that anterior lateral thigh. And it that's is. what we're doing. Like, that's it. And it's not to say that the deltoid wouldn't work if there was no thigh or you couldn't give it in the thigh for some reason. You certainly could give it in another muscle, but you just get the best and most rapid absorption through the anterior quad in that thigh compartment. So, so yeah, that's a, another great pearl from the article. They did talk about how several groups have tried to define criteria for anaphylaxis, but again, not entirely helpful because the criteria scheme and the grading systems they developed, like the Delphi group and Brown et al., did not include a correlation to treatment guidelines. And so definitions and grading without corresponding treatment algorithm equals a whole lot of effort that's not very helpful, unfortunately, clinically. The pathophysiology section is pretty straightforward. It's mostly IgE mediated. There are some things that can cause it that are non-IgE mediated through secondary pathways, but that's quite rare. It's all about histamine release and the wide variety of downstream effects, as they put it, like vasodilation and bronchoconstriction and vascular permeability and increased glandular secretions and tachycardia and hypotension, all of that stuff that happens that causes that clinical syndrome of anaphylaxis that we're used to seeing. The uh, epidemiology, I found very interesting. Because Same. I'm always interested in, in what's kind of triggering these things. So the most common causes, food, insect stings, medications, immunotherapy injections. I've seen a few of those with our cancer mm -hmm. center close by. Vaccines, latex, alpha-gal, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the large category of just idiopathic, we don't know why. In children, the top two were food and insects. And in adults, the top two were medications and insects. Bringing us to Dr. Beans. Eckler's favorite, most life-threatening animal, animal in the world there. being. I looked this up today, and apparently the most dangerous animal worldwide is probably actually mosquitoes, given the, the burden of malaria, malaria and everything else that they carry. But from an allergy and anaphylaxis perspective, especially in like developed nations where mosquitoes are more controlled, yes, bees. Bees are your your thing to be afraid of bees. that goes bump in the night. It's so crazy. When we first actually moved into our home, there was a bee's nest, not a wasp nest, but a fully formed bee's nest at the base of a tree in our backyard. And I remember going over there and the realtor going, oh, isn't that nice? I mean, there's a... It's like nature in your backyard. And I went, that's nice, but it's at the base of the tree where my children can reach it. So this hive is getting moved. We didn't kill the bees, but I did call a, somebody come in and a bee expert and they transplanted the hive. It was very nice to see them do it, but uh, those bees were not going to live that close to my children. Lots of foods can cause anaphylaxis. Interestingly, 90% of the food-related allergies are cow's milk, eggs, soy, wheat, shellfish, fish in general, peanuts, and tree nuts. And the childhood allergies to foods like the cow's milk, egg, soy, and wheat will often resolve, while the childhood allergies to things like 
peanuts, fish, and tree nuts don't necessarily resolve, mm -hmm. which I also found interesting. There are some risk factors for developing anaphylaxis. On page five, there's a great little figure. Figure one risk factors include things like history of prior bronchospasm, asthma, people who have atopic dermatitis. Those are the things that kind of predispose them to perhaps developing allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. And then people who are on the immunotherapy or taking certain medications like NSAIDs. And lastly, people who are on medications like beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and even some of the psychiatric medications too, place them at risk for anaphylaxis. Yep. Pre-hospital care is something we talk about a lot in anaphylaxis. So if you're listening and you're a paramedic or an EMT, then you know anaphylaxis is really 99% recognition and knowing that this is anaphylaxis and then initiating therapy in the field which can be difficult. You know, I recall actually having a patient flown to the emergency department by an air crew who had anaphylaxis, diagnosis made in the field, had been stung by something, was hypotensive and short of breath by the time EMS arrived, had been given steroids and histamine blockers and was flown yeah. getting... IV fluids arrived hypotensive. And when I said, okay, and how much epinephrine did you give? Their answer was, well, the patient is tachycardic. And I said, uh-huh. And he's also hypotensive and in anaphylaxis. And they said, well, our protocol says epinephrine is contraindicated if their heart rate is above 130. And I said, huh. Well, I can see why you didn't here for it. two minutes. Watch what happens. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, you know, it was interesting because that was a conversation I had to have ultimately with their medical director, because that just, that was their protocol. And, and that is what you're supposed to do in the field. It's interesting to see that protocol because as we mentioned already earlier, there is no true hard stop contraindication to administering epinephrine. There are some things to keep in mind, like sure, it can make you more tachycardic and sure, it comes with side effects and palpitations and, and, and so on. But if you're dying from anaphylaxis and if you're tachycardic and hypotensive and in shock, the treatment is still to give epinephrine. And so in that case, we did and the patient did improve, thankfully, and he didn't have a bad outcome. But it was an interesting conversation with the medical director to try and get that protocol changed. So yes, the mainstay recognize it in the field while you're transporting the patient and then begin therapy, which is, of course, epinephrine and then H1 blockers. Can I add on to that for just a second? Because I feel like this is maybe one of my other big takeaways. I find that when I'm discharging patients, I'm not always sure that they're going to be able to fill that prescription for epinephrine. So I always say, look, if this happens again, if you have a biphasic reaction and your symptoms come back or it's six months down the road and you get an anaphylactic reaction and you don't know where your EpiPen is, call an ambulance, have them bring an EpiPen to you because they can get an EpiPen to you much faster than you can get to me and get registered and get triaged and finally get to the point where I can give you epinephrine. So it, wherever you are, home, traveling, whatever it is, always think about calling 911 because you don't have to come to the hospital in the ambulance, but you'll be very thankful that they brought you an EpiPen in like, you know, five to six minutes or something like that, that it takes an ambulance to get to most seats. Yeah, that's a great point. They'll get to you lights and sirens far more quickly than you Way can get faster. anywhere to get an EpiPen. That's Epi is what you need. So let, let someone with the right to drive real fast bring you an Epi pen. Absolutely. And then the ED care. So ABCs being at the top of the list airway. I, thankfully, I have never actually that I recall had to intubate someone in anaphylaxis. You ever had that experience? A couple of kids. New York City, kids that would come out of Central Park that got stung by a bee or got into peanuts or something that they... They shouldn't have eaten and then they were traveling. They were exposed to foods or things that they weren't used to because we had so many tourists come through. But I remember a couple of cases of kids that just came in crashing because it's hard to get them out of the park wherever they are, like trying to get in there with an EMS crew and everything else, like across the grass and wherever they are in the middle of a field. So we, we had to intubate this, this like six-year-old. And I remember I was airway. And my, one of my other like co-seniors, it was one of those days where like the seniors got to run the whole ER, you know, we, we ran it and I just felt like he did a great job getting all the meds into this kid as soon as we could. And I managed to get his airway secured before he swelled up anymore. Cause he was already starting to swell pretty good. 
And, you know, we, we got him on, on a, on a vent and we got things to calm down. And I think he went home the next day, but it, it really gave me a profound, you know, no, I don't want to say fear of it, but that's what it is. Like it, it made me appropriately respect how dangerous this can be yeah. and how you need to get quickly to the point where you protect that airway and you get the epi and you get something into them to try to, to get things to calm down before you lose. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So airway is at the top of the list and in conjunction with epinephrine. So as you're doing this assessment, as soon as you get whiff of the anaphylaxis cause, someone else can be administering the epinephrine as you're dealing with the airway. That is probably a conversation for another day, but all your airway adjuncts, all your tools, all of your equipment that you need for the difficult airway is going to come into play in this scenario. And then it can be difficult trying to figure out how long am I supposed to watch this person before I take the airway. The conversation in the article was surrounding the airway getting worse, worsening voice changes, strider obviously being the worst case scenario, but sometimes people just come in with a hoarse voice or have normal phonation and just a sense of fullness in the back of their throat. And really, this is the person you're sitting at the bedside and watching as they're getting their epinephrine, trying to make sure that things aren't getting worse while someone is assembling all of the equipment that you need in order to proceed. And if you end up not using it, that's great. But you really should be preparing for a worst case scenario very quickly. Whenever we're talking about kids or, or anyone that's little like this, I always think that you're looking at your Braslow, you're trying to figure out your doses, but I try to have the epi dose in my head. So once you get a weight on that kid, whatever their weight is, you just put a dot in front of their weight in terms of kilos, and that's their epi dose. So if they're 10 kilos, it's 0.1. If they're 20 kilos, it's 0.2. Once they're 30 kilos, you can give them an adult epi pen because then they're adults because that's just 0.3. So I, I find that that's really helpful for me because once I have an idea of their weight, I can put a dot in front of it. And when the nurses ask how much epi am I given, that's, that's my epi dose. And yeah, I'll that's a great way to remember it. I like two that. or three of those until I feel like things are getting better. And then if not, I'm starting to look at going to a drip. And my drip is just going to be some single digit number that, that's kind of close to their weight. Like I'd start them at two mics a minute if they're 20 kilos, three mics a minute for 30, four, five, kind of, kind of that where I'm starting and going up. Yeah. Yeah. The math is not difficult. It's in the article as well. And it's also in probably whatever pocket reference you're looking at. It's a very important medication. Most of the drug references have it listed there. So. You don't even have to commit it to memory. Just know where you can find it. True. Uh, steroids. Interesting conversation, really, in the article regarding steroids. What uh, do you give? I was I was intrigued by this because I've seen all the writing and stuff. But what do you yeah. actually give your your anaphylactic reactions, or even your like your severe allergic reactions that you're you're kind of on the fence, but you're not sure if you're going to quite give them that yet? I still give the steroids. So I, which I, one though? This was this was my question. Which steroid? Oh, I see. Well, if they're in the ED, it depends on the severity of the reaction. So if they're in the ED and they have an IV and it's a serious reaction, I'm giving the solumedrol. Yeah. And the it's interesting, the dosing, because the dosing is based primarily on how much comes in the vial. That's mm -hmm. the science of the dosing. <laughs> it's 125 milligrams in the vial of solumedrol. You could certainly give one to two milligrams per kilogram or... The default, it seems in the ED in most cases, is an adult is just getting 125 milligrams as they are on the back of the EMS truck because that's just what comes in the vial. Although sometimes people will show up from an urgent care setting having received steroids IM and they get 60 milligrams or 80 milligrams and I go, oh, that's interesting dosing. And then I realize, oh, that's weight-based dosing, which is completely appropriate, mind you. But we all seem to be defaulting to just what's in the vial dosing. <laughs> So I give Decadron. Sure. Because it yeah. lasts longer. And I feel like if I'm going to give them protection for that biphasic reaction, and I don't really think steroids work for this anyways, then I want to give them one long acting dose and then I'm done. And I don't need to write them for any kind of taper or burst going home. I don't need to worry that the solumedrol is going to start to run down in 12 hours. And are they going to start reacting in the middle of the night? So I give Decadron. And I thought that was one of the only interesting things about the article is they didn't address Decadron as a steroid option. And I, I found that to be one of those things where I, it seems intuitively to make sense to me, but there isn't good enough data to prove which steroid or even if steroids really make a difference in this. So, Yeah, I agree. I think you have to, this is probably more the nuance of where more data would certainly help. The, in my mind, if they have ingested something, then 
I seem to favor the steroids in that scenario because at least in my mind, I'm thinking, well, you ingested this, it's in your GI tract. If it hasn't been eliminated yet, there may still be an ongoing response of some sort. Sure. So I'm going to give you the steroids just on the off chance that there's still something left and absorbing, and you're going to have to continue using Benadryl, maybe a H2 blocker at home, especially if I had to give you a dose of epinephrine, I'm probably going to cover you for a short while with steroids. In that scenario, I mean, Decadron is great. One-time dosing, up to 72 hours of coverage. It's really ideal if you don't have access to it. Solumedrol, prednisone, whatever it is you want to use. That, that's kind of how it works in my mind. They did talk about the biphasic reaction in the article, and they did a good job describing it. It's thought to be a second allergic reaction or presentation of anaphylaxis. It doesn't have to be as severe as the first one, but it can occur anywhere from one to 48 hours later from the same cause without re-exposure to another trigger, which is interesting. I've never seen a patient with a true biphasic reaction. Most of the time I see them back, it's days or weeks later, and they're reacting again to another exposure. But certainly, it is something that is reported to occur, and there is no good data, like you said, that says that steroids prevent or impact that at all. But there's just no good data, period. So we don't really know. It's kind of a gray zone. But if you're having anaphylaxis and I'm treating you in the emergency department, I'm throwing the kitchen sink at you. And I'm not holding off because of a lack of evidence in this scenario. You're getting the H1 and the H2 blocker and the steroid and the epinephrine and the epidrip if necessary. And we're going pretty aggressive with every medication I can throw at you until you're stable. I, I have, I've not had IV cetirizine where I had like an option to give a second generation H1 blocker. Mm -hmm. But I think that I would, if, if it was there and it was not unreasonable, I think that given that IV Benadryl is only going to last like six hours, I, again, I'd rather give something longer acting. And I actually send my patients home, tend to send them home, basically give them a dose of Decatron, and I give them something like loratadine or cetirizine to go home yeah. with for their, their antihistamine. And then I tell them if they get itchy in the nighttime, they can take one dose of Benadryl. But I'd rather have them take that than every six hours Benadryl for 48 hours because they're just going to sleep for two days. Yeah. But I think that this article also pushed me to give more H2 blockers, not just for ingestions, because I think the data is there that people do better with H1 and H2 blockade. So I think I'm going to be more likely to give some, some loratadine and some famotidine for all my patients going home with their anaphylaxis now. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And then it, there was a good discussion there about patients who are non-responders to epinephrine, especially the IV epinephrine and the possibility that they're on a beta blocker and the administration of glucagon in that scenario. So that dosing is also in the article, but something to keep in mind if you're treating someone, especially who's elderly, it's one of the most common prescribed blood pressure medication out there. Beta blockers are very, very common. And it's something to keep in the back of your mind if the person isn't responding to epinephrine, that this might be a possibility. The treatment is listed there. There are some interesting special cases. These are conditions that can occur as a result of anaphylaxis or mimics. Alpha-gal is one of them. If you've never heard of it, this is a condition thought to be caused by a tick bite where people develop IgE antibody responses to alpha-gal disaccharide, which is present in the saliva of the tick, but also unfortunately in mammalian meat. And so these people develop a meat allergy and can present in full-blown anaphylaxis from ingesting meat. Now, because it's ingested, the presentation in this scenario can be delayed significantly up to eight hours. So three to eight hours after ingestion can be the presentation for alpha-gal anaphylaxis. And that can sometimes be confusing because the patient may not then make the connection with the trigger. But something to keep in mind, I have actually treated at least a couple of these cases in the past. Thankfully, the most recent one, the patient told me they had this allergy. And she told me that she'd accidentally eaten some meat and that she used to carry an EpiPen, but it had been a very, very long time since she'd had a reaction. 
And so they expired and she just never refilled them. And then such a common story. Yeah. And then she ate something and it triggered her and she ended up in the emergency department and and she did well, but had to get epinephrine and had to be observed. And it was a, a relatively severe reaction. So I had to watch her for a little longer than typical, but something to keep in mind. We have a lot of ticks where we are now and it's not as rare as you would think. But most often, it just makes me sorry for the patients because they can't eat meat. <laughs> it's terrible. Scombroid, seen a few cases of that? I have as well. Have you ever experienced that? No, but I think both of these things, I feel like if you ask the patients what they ate, they do give you like, oh, yeah, I ate meat or oh, yeah, I ate a fish that I was a little worried about and it did taste a little peppery. And then, and I feel like they're not usually quite as severe, but they're just miserable. Yeah. And I think that if you, you really treat them and then these are the kind of people that, you know, I think that they're on the fence and I tend to offer them the epi. I say, look, I can give you these medicines and then we can see how it goes, or we can give you a dose of epinephrine. And if you're really miserable and it's really getting worse, and then we can see if it turns around. And I find that that's an area of shared decision-making that I really enjoy because I feel like the patients understand they're choosing between the tachycardia and the anxiety that comes with epinephrine and their current symptoms. And I feel like they tend to make good choices and they tend to feel so much better. Mm -hmm. I think about Scombroid every time I think about our cafeteria sushi. <laughs> in our cafeteria in the hospital, we actually have a sushi chef. He's excellent. And I've never seen a case of Scombroid because of his food. I'll put that out there right now. But I always think about it when I go have it. I think, gosh, you know, how long has this been sitting here? I think gas station sushi is a little more concerning than than hospital cafeteria sushi. Because <laughs> I haven't seen the gas station sushi chef, but I don't think he's working as frequently as our sushi chef. Fair enough. Yes. Gas <laughs> I have never had gas station sushi, thankfully. <laughs> I would recommend it. <laughs> uh, and then Kuna syndrome. You ever seen a case of that? No, this was new to me. So I have never seen a case of this. I, I do remember reading about it for oral boards and written boards. And it's one of those things that appears in the emergency medicine study guides as something to be aware of. But Kunis syndrome, that's K-O-U-N-I-S, is an acute coronary syndrome as a result of an allergic or anaphylactic reaction, which is basically vasospasm or vasospasm-induced plaque rupture causing an acute MI with an allergic reaction being the underlying pathology. And you can understand why that can cause some hand-wringing and a little anxiety in treatment because our primary treatment modality, as we've mentioned about 100 times already, is give the epinephrine. There is no contraindication to giving the epinephrine, but there is a known entity, vasospasm, that can occur from epinephrine or other stimulants. And if the person is already having that vasospasm and it's resulting in an acute coronary syndrome, it does give us pause when it's time to give the epinephrine. And it makes us think, well, am I going to then worsen their coronary syndrome? If they have any perfusion at all, am I going to then just completely shut it off? And the answer is, this is very, very difficult. And it's all done in conjunction with your interventional cardiologist, but the epinephrine is still indicated because the underlying pathology is allergic in etiology. And then the standard therapy for both conditions is given. So the patient still is going to the cath lab, is still getting all of their antiplatelet and antithrombotic medications and all of those things in addition to H1 blockers and steroids and epinephrine and all of the standard treatment for life-threatening allergic reaction. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon. Thankfully, I have never personally experienced this in a patient, never had to deal with it. But so I when I was when I was medical director out in my little ER in Colorado, one of our other doctors had what sounds very close to this case. And I think it's pretty tough to tell the difference between Kunis syndrome and someone that's having an anaphylactic reaction that has bad coronary artery disease and then starts to, because their tachycardia and their blood pressure drops, give you signs of cardiac ischemia and start to have some ST elevations. Yeah. And this patient was classic story for anaphylaxis. I forget what the trigger was, but then had a clear STEMI on EKG. And it's a little harder to sell the cardiologist at the next hospital that you're transferring to that it's a really good idea to give this epi and to place. 
And I remember they had a big discussion and the patient got to Nectar Place, managed to make enough of his own epi and got to the other hospital and survived. But it's, it's a tough call, but I always think that you got to really think if the patient's getting worse, that that epi is, is, your, is your best bet, especially if you've got a good story. So that patient did not get epinephrine? Did not get epinephrine mm -hmm. after discussion with cardiology because they felt like that, that this was something that needed more heart treatment than allergy treatment, anaphylaxis treatment. Yeah. Tough. Yeah, that's tough, just tough a tough case. call. Very tough yes. call. Yeah. Hard to play a Monday morning quarterback in that scenario. That's a really, really oh. difficult scenario. That's definitely going to have to be a case-by-case -case kind of basis to make that determination. But another one of those terrifying scenarios, there is little evidence on that in the literature, but the consensus at this point is treat both conditions with what you need to, and the patient still goes to the cath lab or gets standard ACS therapy. So, And if you're transferring them, that's a good conversation to have with the EMS, which is, hey, you know, we're stable right now, but if we get worse, the answer is going to be epi. Because if you've got 30, 60, 90 minutes, like some of these rural transfers are going to have, mm -hmm. that, that you got you to give them the tool that's there because that's really your only other tool in your pocket. Yes, absolutely. So alpha-gal, scombroid, and Kunis syndrome, three of those kind of special populations or special presentations that can occur in the setting of anaphylaxis. Lastly is the common question when we're talking about anaphylaxis and allergic reactions is disposition. So mm -hmm. at what point do I decide, can this patient go home or do they need to be observed longer in the hospital or even in the intensive care unit? And it's interesting how the authors in the article quote the most common answer, which is four to six hours, which sure. I feel like is the answer I get from poison control every time I call for anything at all. It's, is the patient doing well? Yes, it's four to six hours. Observe four if, to six hours. That's right. It's four to six hours, unless it's six to eight hours. <laughs> uh, and in, sometimes in practice, I'm doing one to two hours, depending on how long they need to resolve and get better. But that's with great instructions, a prescription for an EpiPen, and the plan being, hey, if anything gets worse, you're calling the ambulance, you're having them bring you another EpiPen, and we're going from there. And I'm always having a good discussion with them about if you want to stay here for four to six hours, we can watch you. If you want to go home, this is going to be the plan. You'll go fill these right now. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent summary of the conclusion that the authors of the article arrived at as well, that there is really no evidence to suggest that four to six hours is the standard of practice or that it's evidence-based, but that biphasic reactions can occur anywhere from one hour to 48 hours later, and that you need to have that discussion with the patient or the parent of the child so that they understand and that simply because you administered epinephrine doesn't then buy somebody a four to six hour observation, but it does mean that they were sicker, had a higher acuity, and need to be aware that this can occur again. And if it does, they need to have access to healthcare and know how to dial 911 and get to the hospital. The consensus here was it's primarily based on the patient's acuity and their response to therapy and that the clinician decides what it's safe for them to be discharged home, but that there's no clear time frame that's mandated just because you happen to give epi or just because they managed to have an allergic reaction as a diagnosis. And then lastly, when they do go home, the importance of prescribing an epi pen is stressed and that is a great idea, especially if you had to give them epinephrine in the emergency department or they were sick enough to need it in the ED, they should go home with an EpiPen. Don't forget to add that to their prescription medications. You can debate back and forth whether or not they really need the steroids, or if you gave Decadron, they don't need the steroid coverage, but an EpiPen is exceptionally important. They need to have access to that life-saving medication. Do you and ever prescribe the Adra pens, like the, the generic epinephrine pens that are available that are sometimes cheaper for patients? No, nope. tell me more Those about that. Those are available in some of the areas of some of my rural hospitals and some patients that I really thought were, were really resource limited. I would, I would like look into that. And if it was an option in that area that I would give it to people. It's still epinephrine. It is still epinephrine. It's just a different name and it's more of like a generic lower cost version. How interesting. I believe so if I prescribe an epi pen and say that a generic substitution could be made would they automatically do that in the pharmacy? I think it depends on where you are. I think it depends on what they have on the formulary. But yes, I believe that would be how it would cool. play out. Yeah. You know, underlying this conversation is the fact that epinephrine became exceptionally expensive when many of the manufacturers just stopped 
making it. And we reduced our manufacturers to just a handful, if not one. And the cost for the self-injectable EpiPen was skyrocketed and it's several hundred dollars for an EpiPen now. I think over $500 in some areas. And that is just ridiculously cost prohibitive, especially for somebody who has a legitimate anaphylactic reaction. And so it can be very difficult for patients to gain access to epinephrine. And that is something that can play into your disposition. So, you know, if you're dealing with a child or a parent who can't afford the medication and the child had a severe anaphylactic reaction, and especially if there was an unknown trigger, all of these things play into disposition about when it is you need to admit that child for observation until case management can get involved and other resources can be utilized to see if the life-saving medication can be arranged for home. Before and how far, how far do they live for medical care and from another facility? How far is it an ambulance to their house? Because I think that I sometimes take that for granted and, in, in, you know, that everyone's within now that we're in kind of more of an urban setting where we are. But we definitely have patients that are coming from very rural areas where it would take a long time for someone to get out to get them. And I think that would make me more cautious about letting them go home if I didn't think they were going to be able to get the EpiPen and I didn't think that they could get care quickly if they needed it. Yeah, absolutely. I think in our area alone, we see people who sometimes wait an hour for an ambulance just to arrive. And then there's another hour to hour and a half for them to be transported to the hospital. And so you're thinking two and a half to three hours before they show up at your door. And that can be a terribly long time frame and certainly something that can impact return in someone who has anaphylaxis or allergic reaction, especially if the trigger is unknown. We didn't really talk about this, but in in the ED care, there is a small discussion about decontamination. If there is a stinger or an insect-related trigger or something of that sort, then it's important to go ahead and decontaminate or remove that trigger so that the patient doesn't continue to have the reaction that can be a cause for someone not necessarily responding as predicted to epinephrine. But equally important for home, the unknown trigger kind of presents this question mark about when is it going to happen again and why, and how, and how are we going to recognize it? So between time of EMS arrival, access to epinephrine, education level of the patient or the parent, level of illness that you observed, response to therapy, all of these things play into disposition. But the mandatory four to six hour rule does not need to play into your disposition. But to your point, I think referral to allergy is not an unreasonable thing because then you give some of these people without a clear source a chance to then follow up and try to figure out what it is. You're not going to figure it out in all those cases, but I definitely think in, in a lot of them, you're going to get them closer to knowing what is it that they need to avoid to keep this from happening in the future. Yes. Yeah, so that's a, another excellent point. After disposition, home, epinephrine prescription, and referral to an allergist. Those are the two key takeaway points from the authors of the article. They'll do further testing. I tell most of my patients that we don't really know what triggered their anaphylaxis, and that's why they need to go see the allergist and and get more in-depth. But absolutely, if you don't have a local allergist, then kind of be aware of your resources in the wider area where one is available and make sure you let patients know how to gain access to them. At the end of the article, five things that will change your practice. If we didn't mention it enough times, I I am epinephrine, first-line therapy. Number two, remember that anaphylaxis can produce abdominal pain. So skin manifestations plus GI symptoms equals anaphylaxis. And that's treated the same way, epinephrine and antihistamines. Alpha-gal allergy from the tick bite is rare. It's triggered by ingestion of meat, and it typically results in a referral to an allergist to really make that diagnosis. Kuna syndrome is exceptionally rare, thankfully, but that's the acute coronary syndrome as a result of your allergic reaction and presumed to be secondary to vasospasm. And that's a conversation with the cardiologist about treatment, but epinephrine is still used in that scenario. And lastly, scombroid, which is caused by the ingestion of contaminated fish and reportable to your health department in most areas because there'll be multiple people who experience this and they should be aware of the outbreak they can go and hopefully trace it back to a specific restaurant and stop or other gas people station. From getting sick. Or gas station. <laughs> That's right. So definitely reportable, treated a little differently and with a known cause. So if the history is good, antihistamines is the general first-line therapy for that and then notifying public health authorities. Excellent article. Thanks again to our authors, Dr. Zeke and Dr. Sudir.
for writing the article. It is a critically important topic in emergency medicine and something really we see pretty regularly. So a fantastic article. That's July 2022 in Emergency Medicine Practice. Dr. Eckler, thank you as always for the stories and the anecdotes and your insights. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. And that's a wrap. Thanks again to Dr. Eckler for being on the program once again. If you haven't seen the article, it's the Emergency Medicine Practice publication for July 2022, available at evmedicine.net, and it comes with four hours of CME. And don't forget clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net. I want you to go there, check it out, leave me some feedback. It's an amazing resource, and I, I really can't wait for you to see it. Until next time, everyone, be safe. Be safe.